All right, good morning. Uh, today's topic is uh, probabilistic models, so we're turning to probability. We saw probability in the context of classification already, how to do classification uh, using the tools of probability. Uh, today we are going to look at probability for density estimation. So we are looking at uh, unsupervised uh, machine learning, possibly for the first time in the le lecture series. Uh, so we assume that we have some data, but we don't have any labels. We just want to model the probability distribution behind that data for various reasons, which we'll look into at the end. Uh, so in order to do that, we need to develop a couple of tools. First is maximum likelihood. We've seen this before in the previous probability lecture, uh, but we'll look at it in a little bit more detail and a little bit more slowly so that we really understand what's going on. Then to develop maximum likelihood and in order to uh, help us understand what's coming up, we will look in some detail at the normal distribution, which is an important distribution to understand in machine learning. Uh, we've seen it before, but uh, today we're going to look at it sort of step by step. Look at the uh, look at its probability density function, uh, what that looks like, what, why it looks the way it looks, and so on. And then how to apply the maximum likelihood principle, how to find the maximum likelihood parameters for it. And then the break. Uh, and then after the break, we will look at the. Uh, Oh yeah, so we, uh, with the normal distribution, we will end on what is called a mixture of Gaussian's model. Gaussian is just another name for a normal distribution, uh, which is one model that is difficult to fit easily using the maximum likelihood principle. So that's what we're looking at in the second half of the lecture, how to fit that. And we'll look at a uh, new philosophy for optimization. We've seen a lot of gradient descent. Now we're going to look at an alternative to gradient descent, which is alternating optimization. which we will uh, look at first in the context of clustering. Just to illustrate the principle, we will uh, look at an algorithm called k-means clustering. It's a very simple algorithm just to illustrate the idea. And the main part of the second half, we will look at the EM algorithm, which is an, another alternating optimization algorithm which can be used uh, and is most often used to fit these mixture of Gaussian models. Uh, we'll start with an intuitive explanation of how it works without going in too much detail into why it works that way. And then we'll look at it more formally, which will give us, um, show us why the solutions are the solutions that they are. And it will show us that the algorithm actually converges, uh, not to the global optimum, unfortunately, but at the very least to a local optimum. But that's all in the second half. First, let's start with maximum likelihood. And I sort of rushed it in the first lecture, so let's now look at it a little bit more slowly and steadily at what the maximum likelihood principle is. So here's a very simple example. Imagine that you have two coins, one flat and one slightly bent. So if you flip a bent coin, the probability of it landing one side is a little higher than the probability of landing the other side. So for the flat coin, we have equal probabilities uh, or the straight coin, as I've called it here. We have equal probabilities of heads and tails, both one half. For the bent coin, they are in unequal. So the probability of heads is a bit bigger than the probability of uh, tails. So imagine we put these coins in a bag and we ask a friend of ours to pick one coin without showing us, to flip it a number of times, and to tell us what comes out. And this is what he tells us. Head, tails, head, head, and so on. So the question is, given this data that we observed, which of these coins is most likely to have been the one that the friend picked? So that's a metaphor for model selection in statistics, and basically almost all of what we do in machine learning. We observe some data, 
we have a space, a class of possible models, in this case two coins, and we need to figure out, given the data, which of the models is best. And in this case, because we're doing, prob uh, doing it probabilistically, which one is most likely. So let's work out this example. Uh, according to the maximum likelihood principle. There's lots of principles to tell you how to do this, and certainly the maximum likelihood is not always the best or uh, definitely the optimal, and there's lots of things wrong with it, but maximum likelihood is sort of route one, the first thing to consider. Uh, which tells us the look at the probability of the data given the model, the conditional probability of the data conditioned on the model. Look at that as a function of the model. So this here is the variable, the model. And then find the model that maximizes that value. So this function here is called the likelihood. If you look at this conditional probability as a function of the model, then it's called the likelihood. So we take the data as given and we look at the model as the variable, then it's called the likelihood. And then we maximize over that function. That's called maximum likelihood fitting. So in this case, we have to look at the likelihood for the bent coin and the likelihood for the straight coin and figure out for which one this conditional probability is the highest. And in more general terms, we arc max over the model, which is in the model space, to fit this likelihood function, to maximize this likelihood function. So far, so straightforward. So we can do this for our example and ask which coin uh, gives us the highest probability. So if we look at the uh, straight coin at the bottom, uh, all probabilities are just one half. So we just get, for however many flips, we multiply the value one half, which evaluates to this. And for the bent coin, it's uh, four fifth for the heads and one fifth for the tails. So what we see here is that actually the uh, bent coin gives a very slightly higher likelihood. So that's our maximum likelihood model. So that's the basic idea of maximum likelihood fitting. And everything else we do with maximum likelihood is just um, more complicated models, bigger model spaces, more complicated variables. So instead of having two things in your model space, you can have infinitely many models. You can have uh, continuous variables, as in the case of the normal distribution. But this is the basic principle. Uh, and usually, uh, what we do instead of taking the likelihood, we take the log likelihood. So in, uh, we take this uh, likelihood function and we put a logarithm in front of it uh, because the maximum then doesn't change. So that's exactly the same thing, except these probability uh, functions and probability density functions are a lot easier to evaluate in log space. Uh, so this is a lot like what we've been doing already in machine learning. We've been, we've been uh, stating our loss function and then minimizing our loss. Uh, and log likelihood fitting is very similar in that we just take this log likelihood as an optimization function that we want to maximize. Uh, and if we put a minus in front of it, then we can minimize it. So then it's the same. Then it's broadly the same thing as a loss function. So fitting a probability uh, distribution to some data is very similar to this sort of loss minimization that we've been doing so far. <coughs> so that's maximum likelihood principle, which we're now going to apply to the uh, normal distribution. But before that, before that, we will look at the normal distribution with a little bit more, uh, uh, in a little bit more detail. So here's what's coming up. We'll look first at one-dimensional normal distributions. So normal distributions, uh, also called univariate normal distributions. Normal, uh, so it's distributions over one number, give us the probability of somebody's height or um, of a grade, for instance. Um, then we'll look at the relation between that distribution and linear regression. We've looked at linear regression a lot already, but there's actually quite a, a deep, well deep, there's quite a, an interesting connection between the normal distribution and linear regression that we haven't looked at yet. 
So look at that. Then we'll extend this um, univariate normal distribution to a multivariate normal distribution. So we'll see how it looks if we want to fit the distribution to a uh, space of uh, more dimensions, more than one dimension. And then finally we'll look at the mixture of Gaussian models, which is basically a model that combines multiple normal distributions. Uh, like I said, a Gaussian is just a synonym for a normal distribution, which is named after this guy, Carl Friedrich Gauss. Uh, one of the top three finest mathematicians ever to have lived. The other one is Euler. Third one depends on who you ask, but the, first, the one and, uh, number one and two are always Euler and Gauss. Um, and he more or less invented the normal distribution. So I'll look at uh, where that comes from as well. Um, so I assume you've all <clears throat> you're all roughly familiar with it, the normal distribution. It looks like this. The horizontal axis is your uh, sample space, the things you uh, have a probability over. It has a mean and it has a variance, which determine its shape, and it's always got this bell curve. So the probability mass is in the middle. Most of the, the most likely outcomes are in the middle here. So a question I normally ask, it's a little too early for trick questions, so I'll, I won't ask it. Uh, Outright, but basically the question I normally ask at this point is to uh, look at the normal distribution, look at these two points. The red point is uh, the mean or close to the mean, and the blue point is slightly away from the mean. Which of these two points has the highest probability? So I do do the normally, normally you would say, well, that's the red point because it's right on the mean. Uh, but actually both have the same probability, which is the probability of zero. Uh, <clears throat> which is a slightly pedantic but also quite important point that none of these points on this line have probability. They have a probability density. But if you look at the probability of one point in isolation, it's always zero. because It's an infinite space, in continuous space. Um, so the probability of any single point is always zero. And the only thing that has probability is an interval over these... Uh, over this, this line. So if you say there's a pro if these are heights, for instance, of people, there's a probability that somebody has a height between uh, 180 and 190. And there's a probability that somebody has a height between 180 and 181, or 180 and 180.1. And the probability gets smaller and smaller. And as this interval decreases to a single point, the probability always goes to zero. Even if you're right at the mean, at the peak of the probability distribution, probability of a single point always goes to zero. And the only way you can get probabilities is by integrating over this function, which is true for all probability distributions on continuous spaces. Uh, so keep that in mind. We're talking about probability densities here. Uh, so with that in mind, we can look at the, the function, the, distribution, the, the function that describes this probability density of the normal distribution which is a very um, intimidating looking function at first. It's this one. Uh, we have the mean over here and the uh, variance, or the well, standard uh, no, variance here as a parameter. Um, so the first thing I thought we'd do is um, look at this formula step by step, see where it comes from, see what uh, all the different parts do. Uh, and hopefully see that it's not quite as spooky as it looks. So I've talked about this before, but the main defining principle of the probability of the normal distribution is that it has this definite scale. That's what we uh, what we want from it. Uh, is that oops, sorry. certain values are uh, turn down the volume a little bit. Certain values are uh, likely. So like with height, we have a certain range of people that, uh, certain heights that people can have that are uh, normal. And if we get too far outside that range, it's basically the probability is zero. You will never see somebody who's 50 centimeters tall and you will never see somebody who's four meters tall because there's a definite range 
It's a little fuzzy at the ends, but there's this definite scale where the, the, the likely values are. Uh, so what we want, if, the first thing we want in order to make that happen is for the probability outside that range to decay exponentially. And to start with, we'll just put that range on zero. So all we want is something that decays exponentially the further away it gets from zero. So for exponential decay, we can do e to the power of something. So uh, e is just a good base to, to uh, take when you want to write exponential functions. Uh, so we can do e to the power of minus x. That gives us this uh, blue line, which is decaying exponentially. And if we uh, double down on this and we go for e to the power of x minus, uh, for uh, uh, e to the power of minus x squared, then we see an even sharper decay. Uh, and we see that this, uh, this orange line here, it really, it has this sort of point where it flips around, where this, uh, yeah, where it, it dips down very quickly. Uh, so we'll start, with, we'll take the orange line. We'll start there. That has a nice shape. Uh, and if you extend it to the other side of the uh, number line to the negatives, it looks like this. So that's our basic shape that we'll start with. So it's not a very complicated function. It's just e to the power of minus x squared. And that looks like this. And what you see is that it has these um, inflection points here where it switches from uh, increasing, uh, decreasing faster and faster and faster to slowly decreasing slower and slower and slower. And those inflection points are a very good indication of sort of the reasonable or the expected range where most of the values fall. Like I say, this scale is a little fuzzy at the end, so it's sort of arbitrary where we pick it, where we, we uh, bound it, but between these two inflection points, we get a nice sort of range for, uh, for likely values. Uh, so already we see that just this simple function basically already gives us the shape of the bell curve. Um, we can take the derivative and the uh, peaks of the derivative give us these inflection points because where the, the second derivative is zero, that's where it switches from uh, decreasing faster and faster to decreasing slower and slower. So the peaks of this derivative are the bounds of this range that we talked about. So the first thing to do to make this function a bit more manageable, so we can fit it to uh, whatever shape we want, is we'll modify it so that this range that we talked about, this thing between the, the inflection points, uh, has size 2, so it fit, uh, fits between the points minus 1 and plus 1. So the standard range of our function is, uh, has these inflection points between minus 1 and plus 1. Uh, and all we need to do is multiply, put a 0 0.5 in here in order to stretch it a little bit. So if we stretch it by 0 0.5, then we end up with these, uh, this range between minus 1 and plus 1. And then we want to be able to fit this range to whatever range we want. So if we want it narrower, if our data is clustered closer to the zero, then we want to decrease this range. So we want to multiply this uh, 0 0.5 by something. And if we want it wider, then we want to multiply it by something else. So there we insert a value, which we'll call sigma squared, or the standard deviation, which helps us to stretch or shrink this, uh, this, uh, this bell. And then in order to put the mean where we want it, we need to uh, basically shift this uh, horizontal axis left or right, which we do by subtracting something from x. So if we subtract something from x, then the whole range, then the whole uh, horizontal axis is pushed uh, to the right. So then it looks like this. So now we basically have a bell curve. We can stretch it sideways to increase or decrease the standard deviation. We can change the mean to shift it to the left or right. 
and the exponential and the minus and the square help us to ensure that there's this exponential decay with these inflection points. The only thing we don't have yet is that if we integrate over the whole thing, it doesn't sum to 1, which is what we want. Because like we said, if we integrate over an interval, that's the probability of the interval. If we integrate over the whole number range from minus infinity to positive infinity, that has to have probability 1, right? The whole sample space has to have probability 1. Uh, so we need to figure out whatever value we get when we integrate this whole curve and divide by that. And it turns out, I couldn't do it for you here, uh, but if you do that, you get this value, uh, the square of 2 pi times the standard deviation. So you divide by that, and then you ensure that the whole thing uh, sums to, uh, integrates to 1. So that's the probability density function that we saw at the beginning. So that's where it comes from. That's what all the parts of this formula do for us. Uh, just a little bit of notation. We call the probability density of the normal distribution nx conditional on the parameters. So this is how we write the normal distribution. This is not necessarily standard, but it's common in machine learning at least. Uh, and the distribution itself we refer to in this way. So when we say a random variable x is normally distributed with a particular mean and a variance, we write this. So this means that x is normally distributed according to the, uh, these parameters. So that's the univariate normal distribution. So you can return now to uh, the problem of maximizing the likelihood. So let's say we have some data, x, observed, and we want to fit to this data a probability distribution with a particular mean and a particular standard deviation. I seem to be switching back and forth between standard deviation and variance, so just remember, if there's a square, then it's the... I might actually be getting that wrong. Um, it d doesn't really matter for the, the practicalities. So one of them is a variance and one of them is standard deviation. Um, I think this is the variance. Um, the point is we have these two parameters. And we want to fit a distribution to them. So we want to find the two values of these two numbers for which this data is the most likely. So we have a model space. And for every point in that model space, we can plot the likelihood. And the brighter the, we make the point, the higher the likelihood is. So in this space, we just have to find the brightest point, as we've been doing before, which we can do with uh, gradient descent. But in this case, we can also compute it analytically. So let's just. Try that, and we'll see that if we do this, if we start taking the derivative, then the uh, derivative of this log likelihood will simplify very quickly. So this is our, uh, the, basic the basic maximum likelihood principle. We want to optimize our parameters theta to maximize the function log p x given the parameters. Um, if we have multiple data points and we know that they are sampled independently, then the probability of all our data points is just a product of their densities. So we just split that up, and we can work that outside the logarithm, and then the product becomes a sum. So we're finding the maximum over this sum of the logarithms of all the densities of our data points. So then we fill in this big scary function for the density of the normal distribution. Uh, and what you see is that because we have a logarithm here, uh, this simplifies a lot. Uh, so it's a logarithm of this my, times this. So that splits up, splits up into the logarithm of the first part plus the logarithm of the sec second part. The ln cancels out against the x, which is why we're taking the natural logarithm in this case instead of the binary logarithm that we used earlier, just because it cancels out against this uh, this base e exponent. Uh, so here, the second term is just the exponent part of the normal distribution. Uh, so this is our maximum uh, likelihood objective. Now, to illustrate, let's just look at the mean in isolation. 
which is a uh, simple. So this one is uh, we're arc maxing for the mean and for the variance here. Uh, let's look at the mean in isolation, which is a little bit simpler. So we're looking for the derivative of this log likelihood function over the mean, which is this thing we had in the previous slide over the mean, and we've worked out the sum of the data points already. Uh, so you see that the gray term here uh, can, uh, disappears because mu doesn't appear in it. So we're really only looking at this uh, second part here. There is a constant in front that we uh, this one over two sigma squared, which we can work out in front. Uh, so we just have the square of the data minus the mean over the mean. Uh, which we've seen before how to do this, just uh, the chain rule. So the square goes out in front, it cancels out against this one half we have here, and we are left with just a sum over x minus mu. So that's a derivative, which we can now set equal to zero to figure out what uh, mu should be. So we take the derivative, we set it equal to zero. Uh, this sum Oh yeah, so first the constant bit out in front with the sigma uh, disappears because we've set it equal to zero, so we can remove any constant multipliers. So we're left with this, uh, x minus mu. So we can work this out into two sums, sum over x minus the sum over mu. So the sum over mu is just n times mu. Uh, so we get, we're left with this, so we work the uh, x to the other side and then the n to the other side and we find that mu is just the arithmetic mean. This just represents the arithmetic mean, just the sum over all x divided by n, the number of items in our data set. So after all that, what we've proved is that the arithmetic mean is actually the um, maximum likelihood estimator for the mean of the normal distribution. And actually when Gauss sort of invented the normal distribution, he did this, but the other way around. So he started by saying, well, we have this sort of arithmetic mean. If we have some quantity that we want to estimate by a bunch of measurements, then the arithmetic mean is uh, a natural way of doing that. And then he worked backwards to what the distribution would be so that the arithmetic mean would be the most likely estimator, and then he came up with the normal distribution. Um, so that's one place where you see uh, the, the normal distribution maximum likelihood fitting. Um, and we can apply the same thing to uh, least squares regression. So we've seen least squares regression already a bunch of times. We have a bunch of points, we want to fit a line through it. Uh, so we look at the residuals, the distance between what the model predicts and what we actually see in the data. And one way of formulating this problem is to uh, assume that the data follows the model exactly. So that the data is exactly modeled by a line, but there's some extra process that then adds noise to our data. Maybe we're not observing the data quite correctly, or uh, there's something else happening, but basically we assume that there's some distribution x, which we don't know, which produces points that are exactly on this line, and then there's some other process, uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's the thing you see here. Uh, sorry, it's uh, some process that produces both x and y, where, uh, the relation between x and y is linear, so whatever the distribution of x, once we know x, we apply a linear transformation and we get y. That's an exact linear transformation, except on top of that, there's a little normally distributed noise. So e is another uh, random variable which is added to this uh, linear transformation of x to produce y. And e is normally distributed with zero mean and some standard deviation. So that looks like this. We have this uh, points 
on the line exactly, but then added to it, there's some noise from the normal distribution. So now we have a probability distribution uh, of y given x. So if we know x, we compute y or we sample y by applying this linear distribution and adding this uh, Gaussian noise. So we can express that as py given x plus the parameters of this line, uh, which is a maximum likelihood problem. So we want to, to fit this line, we want to find the parameters w and b that maximize the likelihood of our observed data, y and x, which we can phrase like this. Uh, so we insert the logarithm to make it easier. We sum over all, sorry, we take the product over all data points, x and y. And what you see then is that this probability is normal distribution, univariate normal distribution, where all the parameters are in the uh, conditional. So the mean of this normal distribution is this uh, linear transformation of x. And then this, uh, there's some variance that we don't, uh, we don't know, but it turns out we don't need to know. And then we want to maximize, we want to fit all those parameters to maximize the density of y. So we fill in the big scary uh, formula for the density. Uh, we work out the logarithm to make it a sum. So we get this ln in front again, so we a uh, bunch of things fall out. The, uh, this normalizer here falls out, the exponent is removed, so we end up with just a thing inside the exponent. The minus goes out in front, so we see this. Uh, the one half also goes out in front, the one divided by the uh, variance doesn't affect the maximum, because that's uh, the variance is constant, so it doesn't really matter what we pick for the variance, so we see that it disappears from our optimization objective, that's why we don't need to know the variance actually. And what we're left with, we can see here, uh, oh yeah, so and one final step, we have this minus here, if we remove the minus then the arc max becomes an arc min. So what we're left with at the end is just our least squares linear regression objective. So all of this is just to say that doing least squares regression with a, uh, sorry, doing linear regression with a least squares objective like this is, has this hidden, this implicit assumption that your errors, your residuals are normally distributed. So that's least squares regression. Let's now look at this uh, normal distribution again and see how we can extend it to n-dimensional spaces, because really that's what we're interested in most of the time in machine learning. We have these big feature vectors and we want to fit distributions to those, uh, that ki those kinds of spaces, that kind of data. Uh, so this is what the probability density looks like for a multivariate normal distribution. Look very similar, the variance becomes a covariance, so it's now a matrix. Uh, the square between the mean and the data point, data points are now vectors, mean is now a vector, and their square has become a dot product of their difference, the square of their difference becomes the dot product of their difference, and this variance is now a, the inverse matrix of the covariance is now in there in the middle. Uh, so let's see where this, uh, let's follow the same steps we did earlier and see how this, uh, this formula emerges exactly. So we start again with this bell curve. We want to, we want something that has a definite mean, a definite range, and the further away we get from that point of, of likely observations, uh, the more we uh, want the probability density to, to decay. So as we move away from the point where we know likely stuff is to happen, the probability density should decay uh, exponentially or squared exponentially again as it did before. Uh, so if we put that point of high probability of high likelihood 
at the origin at zero, then we're just looking at the norm of the distance to that uh, uh, the distance to that point or the distance to the origin. So this is the the squared norm, and we take the exponent of that, which is sort of like rotating the univariate normal distribution around the origin, and you get this surface looks like this. So this is the basic probability density function to which we're now going to add parameters in order to uh, help us uh, help us change its uh, uh, to help us uh, change its attributes. Uh, so the square of the norm is just the dot product of a function with itself, of a vector with itself. And we add this one half in front so that the inflection point, what was previously the inflection point is now an inflection circle. So all the points where the function changes from the rising quickly to rising slowly uh, form a circle here. So that's what the one half is for. And the dot product is just because we took the square of the norm, so that's equal to the dot product. Uh, so now we have a bell curve with uh, the inflection circle on the unit circle. So all the points that are distance one from the origin uh, have this uh, this property that they're on the that they're inflection points, and basically our characteristic values are all within the unit circle now. Uh, so this time we'll normalize first. So this thing, if you integrate, if you look at what the mass under the under this mountain is. Uh, it's not one again. It's something some finite value, but it's not one So we need to divide by whatever that value is to make it one. We'll do that first this time So if you work that out uh, It looks like this so if we multiply this function by this one over square to pi to the power of D Then we get a mountain that uh, has exactly one mass below it So now we need to work out how to inject this mean value and this variance, or this covariance, in order to let us transform this function into any shape we want. And the principle that we're going to use there, which we've seen before, is that we can transform probability distributions the same way we transform points. So if we apply an affine, uh, an affine transformation, a linear transformation, to this function, so we multiply it by a matrix, and we add a uh, vector, we translate it by a vector, then the result is also a normal distribution. So I'll take that as given. To make that more precise, if we sample a point x from this standard normal distribution, we'll call this the standard, sorry, we'll call this the standard normal distribution, we sample a point x from this distribution. We multiply it by probability distribution. Uh, so we multiply it by matrix A and add factor T. Then the result is also normally distributed. The resulting factor Y is also normally distributed. So then the question is, if we do this, and Px is the density of x, so Px is this probability density, then what is, and we know A and T, then what is the density qx, let's call it qx, of the resulting point? Can we work that out? So we have a point here sampled from the uh, standard normal distribution. We transform that point by a and t. So what we see is that all the points on this uh, unit circle get transformed into an ellipse. And this point that we've sampled gets rotate it and squeeze up to the top right. So can we then say, in order to figure out what the density of this point is under this new distribution, can we then map the point, map the point back by the inverse of this transformation? So this is uh, A inverse times X minus T is the inverse of this linear transformation. Can we just map the point back and look at what the density of this point map back is under the original distribution P. Well, no, but almost. 
Because the only thing we have to take into account then is that as we map one distribution to another distribution, we can inflate the space or uh, shrink the space. Uh, so we need to fig uh, figure that into this sort of normalization factor of our probability density. If we've inflated the space a lot, we need to divide by more so that everything still sums to one. Luckily, with a linear transformation, it's very easy to see how much the space is inflated because that's the determinant of the matrix A. So if you don't remember exactly what the determinant is, you can look it up. It's a basic function of a matrix, very simple function of a matrix, and the determinant of a matrix tells you how much it inflates space or shrinks space. Uh, so if, start, if we start with the X, then we can basically map the point back to get the probability density under Q, except we have to correct for how much A inflates the space. So we divide by the determinant of A, and then this logic basically works. So we map the point back, we get the probability density of the point mapped back under P, and then we multiply it by 1 over the determinant in order to correct for this inflation. So now that we have this principle, it's a very useful principle in machine learning. We can just apply this to our uh, standard normal distribution. Ah, I didn't animate this one, so sorry for the overload in uh, symbols. Uh, but basically, top left, what you see is this uh, thing we've just um, worked out. Top right, y is our probability density function. So if we apply these two, if we apply this principle on the top left to the function on the top right, we get this second line, which is just a point mapped back. Uh, point X mapped back by, y, by A and T, and then corrected by 1 over the uh, determinant. Uh, we can work out this, on the right we work the transpose inside, so then we get a, uh, the two a minuses next to each other, and they become uh, let's see, we can flip around the a transpose and the inverse, and on the right or sorry, on the left, uh, the determinant, the square of the determinant, this all follows from basic principles of these properties of these determinants. Uh, the square of the determinant is the same as the determinant of A times its transpose. So that allows us to uh, put a uh, square root around this thing so that we can work it into the uh, normalization factor to the right. Uh, so we have this a times a t here on both sides with a little bit of rewriting. And that's what we call the covariance, a times a transpose. And we see that the uh, translation term is just equal to the mean. So basically, from this one principle of how to turn a uh, linear transformation into a new probability density function, we can see where the uh, parameters of the standard normal of the multivariate normal distribution come from, which gives us this probability density function over a multivariate uh, over a high dimensional space, n dimensional space. We can use the same principle for sampling. This is going to come up a bit more, so this is important as well. So if we have a way for sampling from a standard normal distribution, from a univariate normal, uh, standard normal distribution, we'll uh, take that as given. We'll assume somebody's figured that out. Uh, for instance, numpy.random.randn gives you these kinds of samples. Then we can sample from a uh, given univariate 
normal distribution with a given uh, mean and variance by just applying a transformation. So we just multiply by this uh, standard deviation and add the mean. And then we get a sample from a given uh, distribution. So we can s transform a sample from a univariate standard normal distribution to any other, other univariate normal distribution. Then if we want to sample from a multivariate distribution, first multivariate standard distribution, uh, it's very simple. If we want to, de if we want to sample from a d-dimensional standard distribution, standard normal distribution, we just take d samples from this univariate standard distribution and we s uh, stick them into a vector. And turns out that's a sample from a uh, d-dimensional normal uh, standard normal distribution. And then if we want to turn that sample into a sample from a different normal distribution with some given covariance and some given mean, what we do is we find some uh, matrix A such that this property holds, such that A times its transpose is the uh, covariance, which we can do by various decompositions. Uh, and then we just apply this linear transformation a times x plus the mean to this standard normally distributed uh, sample that we had earlier. And then we get a uh, uh, sample from this particular multivariate normal distribution. Uh, so that's a useful trick and that uh, uh, is going to come up again in a future lecture. But for now, that's just so that's useful. This is how you sample from normal distributions. So finally, before the break, to set up what's going to happen after the break, uh, sometimes you have data like this. So this is the, uh, these are the grades from um, a couple of years ago, 2017, I think, for this uh, course. And this roughly sort of follows a normal distribution. But really, it kind of follows a bunch of different normal distributions. So you have a peak here, sort of between seven and eight. You have a peak around six, and you have a peak somewhere around three. So what you have sort of is three groups of students, students who uh, were very ambitious and thought maybe that the course was quite easy. So they got sort of uh, quite a good grade. Maybe the students who uh, had last time or thought the course was very difficult, uh, who got just a passing grade, did just enough work to get the passing grade. And then there's the students who probably at some point thought, well, I'm not going to pass this course, but I'll just try anyway, and got a very low grade. So you have sort of three groups of students, and for each group of these, each group of students in isolation, you have a normal distribution. So this distribution that we see here is by itself not a normal distribution because it has three different peaks, but it's kind of like the sum of three different normal distributions. Luckily, that's a model that exists, and it's called the Gaussian mixture model. So for a Gaussian mixture model, you need a bunch of components. Each component is a normal distribution. Each component has its own mean and its own covariance, so we're going to multivariate distributions right away. And each component also has its own weight. So, as you can see, there are lots more students getting passing grades than students getting non-passing grades. So these components, these normal distributions, are much more well represented, so they should weigh more heavily. So we put uh, uh, weights on these distributions, W1, W2, W3, which are just numbers, uh, positive numbers that sum to one. So if these are our three distributions, three normal distributions in one dimension now, just to make these to plot, and these are our weights, uh, we scale the distributions by the weights just by multiplying them. So you see that uh, these ones are all normal distributions, so these are all have the height so that they sum to one. But what you see is that the weight for the red one, for the students uh, getting low grades, is much lower. So that one shrinks a lot more. And proportionally, the green one gets quite a high peak. Um, 
And now we can just sum these up because we've made sure that these weights sum to one. So if we sum all these up, we know that the result, the resulting probability density, the, the resulting function is a probability density. So that looks like this. So the, we get a function where the uh, value at every point x is the sum of three probability densities weighted by this wi, which is just a sum of these uh, red, green, and blue probability densities. And that, as you can see, is a much better fit for this kind of data that we saw. But the problem is that if we now want to do a maximum likelihood fit on this, so we want to argmax for all these parameters, for the weights, the means, and the covariances, sum over all the, sum the log likelihood for all the data points x, we see that this probability density is defined in terms of sum, and that sum is now inside the likely, inside the logarithm. And as you well, now, if you uh, did the first homework exercise, sums inside of logarithms are kind of a nightmare. There's nothing to do there. There's nothing to pull apart. To There's no way to work out that sum in a very easy way. So this is not something we can work out analytically. Here we have to start approximating things, either by gradient descent, which is possible for this one, or what we'll look at after the break, by alternating optimization. Uh, so we'll uh, take a quick break now, and in 15 minutes, we'll have a look at that. All right, welcome back. Uh, so second half, let's look at this uh, alternating optimization. So we saw in the first half that for uh, some models, like the uh, Gaussian mixture model, there's no easy way to find an analytical solution. The model is too complicated. Uh, so one way to do that is uh, gradient descent. We already saw that for complicated models, you can find a fit with gradient descent. You can do that for the Gaussian mixture model as well. But a more popular approach is to use alternating optimization, which we'll look at uh, in the second half. <coughs> and the principle behind alternating optimization is that if you have one big model that is difficult to fit or one formula for which the one optimization function which you cannot find analytically. Sometimes you can find it if you freeze part of the model, if you fix part of the model to some, some value. So you split the parameters into two groups, you fix one group to one value, then you can solve the other ones analytically. And if you do that, what you can do is just guess the values for one group, some random guess, solve the rest of them analytically, then take that solution and then solve the other ones analytically, then freeze that, and so go back and forth and back and forth. And under the right conditions, that's a very efficient way to, to fit the model. So I'll look at a very simple example first, just to build some intuition for this uh, process. This is called the k-means clustering algorithm. This is our first look at a clustering algorithm. So the objective, if you remember from the first lecture of clustering, is to take a set of points and to separate them into clusters. So we say before we start, we want three clusters for this point. That's a hyperparameter. We just decide three clusters. And we want to divide this set of points in some natural way into three clusters. And it's not very strictly defined. So clustering is always a bit of a problem that the definition of what constitutes a good clustering is not very well defined. But that's, so that usually comes from the algorithm. But the k means Clustering is just one way of doing it. And the way it operates is by picking three points in this space, which we will call the means, and we'll give them colors. Uh, blue, green, and red. And uh, basically, the um, well, let's go through the algorithm first. So we put these points in random uh, randomly somewhere in the space, or arbitrarily somewhere in the space. And what we do then is we assign clusters according, uh, we assign points to uh, clusters by which mean they are closest to. So we have three clusters, the blue cluster, the green cluster, and the red cluster. And we assign a point to the blue cluster if it is closer to the blue mean than to any other mean. 
and we assign it to the green cluster if it's closer to the green mean than to anything else. So which gives us this clustering. So all these blue points are closer to the blue point than to the green or the red point. And then we throw away these means and we recompute them as proper means. So now we look at all the blue points, we take their mean and we make that the new blue mean. We look at all the green points, we take their mean and we make that the new green mean and same for the red points. So we get new means for the red, green and blue points. We throw away the old means and then we recolor the points according to uh, what mean they're closest to. Uh, we recompute the means, we throw away the old means, and we see here that the new mean is already quite close to the old mean, uh, but it's still moving a bit. And we do the same thing again and again. And after a few iterations, we see that this is the um, clustering we end up with. Uh, so, uh, so the question is, how do you decide where you put your first three? That's just random. Doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just arbitrary. Uh, no, so you don't then always end up with the same outcome. So the how you initialize, where it, it's actually very important how you initialize with these kinds of algorithms. Uh, but for now, you can just think of it as an, uh, a random choice. Uh, so the first thing to note is that this uh, converges, but it doesn't converge to the global optimum. So it converges to local optimum and which local optimum you end up in depends on uh, how you pick the initial points. So the principle here, why I call this, why we call this alternating optimization, is that you have uh, basically two things that you want to optimize. The best position for the means and which uh, which would be easy to optimize if you knew the coloring of the points, then it would then it's very easy to compute the mean. But you don't have the coloring of the points. And if you have the mean, then it's very easy to color all the points. But you don't have the means. So you have uh, if you have one thing, then it's easy to optimize the other. If you have the other thing, it's easy to optimize the first thing. You don't have ones, but you just pick an arbitrary value for the first, optimize the other and then optimize the first given the other one. That's the basic principle of alternating optimization. Now we can look at this Gaussian mixture model again, we saw before the break, with its sum of k normal distributions. <coughs> and here we see that we have the same thing, that every point belongs to one of these components. Uh, in this case, it's not a hard sort of belonging to, but it's uh, more of a soft distribution. But we see that the point six, for instance, belongs most strongly to the green component. And that's what we call a hidden variable model. So we observe the data x. But we also know that the data X was generated by first picking a component Z and then sampling from that component. So we have this process generating our data from a variable Z to uh, a variable X, but we observe only X. Where Z here is a simple categorical distribution over the three components. So this X is a normal distribution or the uh, Gaussian mixture model. Uh, but Z is a categorical distribution over these three components. So we sample from this model by sampling X from this distribution over the components. For instance, we get, uh, we uh, decide to sample W1, we sample the first component, uh, which, oh, sorry, which gives us this density function on the uh, sample space. And then from that component, we sample X. Um, so this would be easy, fitting this model, if we had the complete data. If we knew Z for every uh, point, if we knew which component it came from for each 
student in my example if we knew whether they were a struggling student, an ambitious student, or a student who's going to fail, then it would be easy to fit all these three components separately. But we can't do that. We don't know that. So we need to complete the data in some sense. We need to figure out which component the data point belongs to, and then based on that, fit the model. Uh, so the uh, variable z here refers to uh, which component a particular point was sampled from. So we have this um, Gaussian mixture model, right, which consists of three components, three normal distributions. So if we observe a point here, it's sort of uh, assumed that it comes from one of these normal distributions. Right, so sampling a point from this distribution, this Gaussian mixture model, consists of basically sampling first one of the three components according to these probabilities. That value is z, which of those three we've sampled. Yeah. So in this case, z equals 1. And then we sample a point from the first uh, distribution. Uh, so one, technically, the best way to do this, to complete the data, would be to marginalize out z, to just sum over all possibilities. Uh, as we saw in the, the first probability lecture, you can marginalize out. If you have a joint distribution on two values and you don't care about one of the values, you can just marginalize it out. The problem is, so that looks like this. Uh, the problem here is that if we have just two components and 30 points, this sum already has a billion terms. Because it's for every point x, there's two uh, possibilities, and then you do you have to do that sum for all of your data points. Uh, so this becomes a very very big sum very very quickly. So marginalizing marginalizing out is not really a, a, a an option here. Um, we don't have a closed form solution for this maximum likelihood fit. Of, uh, so marginalizing out is sorry, marginalizing out is not an option. We want to do this maximum likelihood fit. We don't have this closed form solution because we have these uh, this sum inside the logarithm which screws things up for us. Gradient descent is possible, but we won't look into that today. Instead, what we'll look at is this alternating optimization approach. So it's the same thing as the k-means. Uh, same principle as k-means. We don't know where we, uh, with k-means, we didn't know for each point which cluster it belonged to. And we didn't know the means of the clusters. So we alternated both in uh, 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 one by one. Here we have the same thing. We don't know which component each point was sampled from. And we don't know the parameters of the components. So if we knew which uh, component each point was sampled from, then it would be very easy to just separate the points by component and fit each component individually by maximum likelihood. And if we have the parameters of the components, we can actually work out a distribution uh, for which component a particular point is most likely to be sampled from. So we can do the same trick here. We can't optimize for the uh, parameters of the model, the parameters of the components, which we'll call theta, together with these latent variables, which component each point came from. We can't optimize them together, but we can do alternating optimization. So given some guess initial guess for the components, we can compute the optimal distribution over z. So we have a kind of soft assignment of responsibilities. We don't know, given this uh, settings for the distributions exactly, uh, we can make a hard choice, like assign a point to a component. But we can get a probability distribution on which uh, component each point came from. <coughs> 
And then if we have that distribution, if we have that assignment of points over uh, components, we can optimize the parameters of the components. So here's the algorithm spelled out. We initialize, we start with the components. We can also start with the assignment of the points, but uh, we'll start with the components. So we'll initialize these three normal distributions with arbitrary uh, parameters. And then we run this loop. We have two steps, the expectation step and the maximization step. The expectation step is we assign responsibilities to each point. So each component takes a certain amount of responsibility for every point. We'll see how that uh, works in detail later. And then once we have this assignment of uh, responsibilities of components to points, we maximize, we fit the components to the data weighed by the responsibility. So what you see is a lot like what we saw for k-means. We have some data. We initialize, it, we initialize it not just by a bunch of means, but by uh, probability distribution. So we have a two-component model here with the two normal distributions. So these are these uh, circles that have the, that capture the main uh, the main area of probability mass. And then the first step given those components is to assign responsibilities to the points. And what you see here in contrast to k-means is that every point gets a little bit of responsibility from either component. So uh, the points sort of top left are entire, almost entirely blue. So the blue component takes almost all responsibility for the points in the top left corner, and the red component takes almost all responsibility for the bottom right point. But if you look in the middle, it's a sort of mixture. So you get a bunch of purple points for which both components say, I may well have been responsible for generating that point. So the responsibility is sort of divided equally between the two components here. So for each component, we now get uh, oh, sorry. My slides are slightly weirdly ordered. Um, so if we look at that in one dimension, we can see how that works, what that responsibility is. So if we look at this point here, 4.8, uh, and we see what should the responsibilities for that point be, sort of look at this sum, weighted sum over the probability densities, and we see this sort of uh, stacked bar chart where we can see the proportions of probability densities that each point, uh, sorry, that each component contributes to this point. And this, we can just interpret this as a probability distribution, so we scale it so that uh, uh, the value is between zero and one. And that gives us the responsibilities for each point. So the responsibility that the green point takes for this point, uh, 4.8, is just the probability density uh, uh, this might actually just need to be the likelihood to correspond to the picture so I'm not exactly sure whether the formula is correct, but we're in the intuitive part, so let's not worry too much about the formula. Ignore the formula, we just assign responsibilities to the size of this likelihood. Uh, so if you look at this, um, Let's look back here. So if you look at this point, we have the uh, blue components. It's assigned, it's taken responsibility for these points. So for every point, it takes some responsibility, but it takes much more responsibility for the very blue points than for the very red points. What we want to do now, like in the k-means algorithm, we want to fit the refit the components to all these points, weighted by the responsibilities. 
Oh yeah, uh, the number of components. A good question. Uh, the number of components is yes, it's a hyperparameter. Uh, yeah, so we have this uh, distribution of responsibilities over the points by the components, and we now want to refit this component to the distribution uh, to this uh, to these points. So we want to fit it to the point where the very blue points have sort of more mass, more importance in the fit than the uh, not so blue points. And that looks like this. So we start by summing up these responsibilities. So R i over x is the responsibility that component i takes for point x. Uh, we sum that up to get a value n i, and that's the total amount of responsibility that component i takes over all the points, summed over all the points. And then the mean, the new mean for component i is just the weighted mean over all the points. So we sum all the points x, but we weight it by this responsibility, and then we divide it by ni to make sure that uh, the whole thing uh, uh, gets weighted properly. So it's basically weighted mean that we take. And same thing for the standard deviation or the, the covariance. It also has this sum. We also just weight all the terms in the sum by the responsibility and divide this thing by one, by uh, ni. And then for the new weights, because we have means, covariances, and weights for each component, the new weights are the new are um, how much of the responsibility each component claims. So what we saw here is that here they claim about equal responsibility, but if a component is very far away, then its responsibility for all the points is very low, then its new weight becomes very low as well. So after all that, we fit using these principles, we fit the new components to the data. We see that they are spread out like this. So these are the maximum likelihood fits of these models according to the uh, to these responsibility assignments. Still not very good, so we do the same thing again. We recolor. And what you see, I think L is the number of steps here, that step by step, slowly, the model converges to finding a nice fit where each model uh, sort of fits to a cluster of points. So even though the initial uh, components, they were chosen here to be very bad, so that you can sort of see how it iterates, they weren't very good. It sort of slowly makes for a good fit. And this is the uh, uh, expectation step, assigning the responsibilities to the point based on the current components. And then the maximization step is refitting the components based on these uh, weighted data sets. So that's a sort of intuitive way of, of how the EM algorithm works. Uh, what can you say about these clusters in general? Well, if it w <coughs> if it works, if it's a good fit, or if the the model assumptions are correct, correct, uh, I'd say that these clusters are normally distributed subsets of your data. So your data is not normally distributed, but if you separate your data out into these two subsets, then those individually are normally distributed. That's not always true, but that's the sort of the ideal case. Um, so intuitively, that's how the algorithm operates, and practically, that's often how it works, so that's very nice. Uh, but there's no real reason to assume so far that any of this is supposed to work. So what we'll look into is a slightly more formal way of dealing with the EEM algorithm. Uh, 
which sets up a couple of tools that we will use, reuse later in the course. And what that will buy us, beyond the intuitive uh, explanation, is it will allow us to prove that EM converges, which is nice, to a local optimum. So no uh, guaranteed global convergence, but at the very least, we know that it converges to a local optimum. It shows that this uh, weighted sample mean and weighted sample variance that we saw here are actually the correct maximum likelihood solutions instead of just intuitively reasonable solutions. And uh, in the process of, of going through this proof, we will use a decomposition of the maximum likelihood that we can reuse later because it's very useful for hidden variable models in general. And Monday, we're going to look at more complicated hidden variable models in neural networks so we can reuse this decomposition. So let's start with that decomposition. Right? It looks like this. Uh, so on the top line, we have the log likelihood. That's what we want to maximize. But for whatever reason, we cannot maximize it. Um, what we do is we introduce a function q, which gives us an approximation on the uh, conditional probability on the hidden variables. So we assume that we cannot optimize uh, LNPX directly because of some hidden variable set. And the conditional on those hidden variables, given X and the parameters, is difficult to optimize for whatever reason. So we introduce an approximation to this function, Z given X. And we'll call that Q. Could be a terrible approximation. Could be a good approximation doesn't matter for this decomposition. This thing holds whatever we pick for Q. Uh, KL is the Kullback Leibler divergence, which we've seen before. So that's just a, a good way of expressing the distance between two probability distributions. And L is this function, which is just what remains. So Q is, a dis Q is an approximation of P. KL of QP is the distance between those two, so that expresses how good the approximation is. And L is what remains. So if we set Q equal to P, then this thing becomes zero, the KL divergence. So then L is just equal to the, uh, the log likelihood that we're interested in. If Q is terrible, then KL is very big, and uh, LQ becomes very small. Why is this true? Walk to the proof very quickly. Uh, it's easiest to do it backwards. So we start with the uh, log likelihood, which we want to show to be equal to these two terms. And we work backwards. So we fill in the two terms. Uh, on the left, the orange part is just the, uh, the L function that we defined which is just the leftover part, and on the right we fill in the definition of the KL divergence, which is the expectation of the logarithm of P divided by Q, expectation under Q. Um, we boom, 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 fill in, oh no, sorry, we can work out the Qs first out of the logarithm, so then it becomes this thing minus, uh, the logarithm of Q, and we can work that thing out of the expectations, and then we get a, uh, from both the orange and the blue point, we get a kind of expectation over L and Q term, which we cancel out against each other. So we are left with just these two terms, uh, which we can squeeze back together again. So it's uh, two expectations over Q, so we can just work that into one expectation over Q, and we can work the two logarithms into each other, which becomes then the first thing divided by the second thing. So the whole thing becomes this. Then the top part is a joint probability on X and Z, which we can separate into a uh, 
probability condition of z conditional on x times the probability of uh, x, which is just a basic rule of probability, slide 22 in the previous probability lecture. And now we can note that we have uh, the same factor at the top as on the bottom. So z conditional on x here in orange and z conditional on x here in blue. So those two cancel out against each other and we are left with the likely, uh, log likelihood. So it's a slightly unintuitive proof because we're working backwards, but this shows that the log likelihood, oh, sorry, I missed one step. It's the log likelihood conditional on x, but x to, uh, conditional on q, but q doesn't appear anywhere anymore, so that expectation disappears. So now we have proof that this thing is equal to the log likelihood. Like I say, it's a slightly unintuitive proof because we're working backwards, but just uh, the important thing to note here is that this thing that we're interested in, the log likelihood, is equal to these two terms, where the blue term, the KL divergence, indicates how good Q is as an approximation of P. So that's in very general terms. So moving back to the Gaussian mixture model, what is Q? Q is a distribution on Z. <clears throat> on our hidden variable. So in our case, Q is just an approximation of the um, responsibilities. So we don't know what the optimal probability is to assign points to components. So here we have points vertically and components horizontally. We don't know how to assign optimally the points to components, but we can fill in any assignment of these components call that Q. So Q is just a big table like this. And that's an approximation. We can do that. We can make it up. We can have a good guess. We can find it from somewhere. It doesn't matter. We get some Q and this decomposition holds for any Q. So how does this decomposition help us then? Well, imagine this line expresses the um, log likelihood. And this is the, uh, oh yeah, and um, theta hat is our optimal model that we don't know, but we want to find. So this is the log likelihood of the optimal model, which is the biggest possible we can find. This is the log likelihood of some other model. We have some random guess, which we want to improve. This decomposition tells us that this log likelihood for any particular approximation Q of this uh, conditional distribution falls apart in two terms. This L function of Q and theta and the KL divergence between Q and P. This is just what we've proved in the previous couple of slides. So if we assign a bunch in the Gaussian mixture model, if we pick a bunch of responsibilities, then our uh, log likelihood falls apart into these two terms. And we can now rephrase the EM algorithm in, as optimizing these two terms, uh, uh, one first and then the other. So the E step, we can now rephrase as uh, re-choosing another Q. So we have some models, some Q and some theta, which gives us some log likelihood. And we now move from these parameters to these parameters by choosing Q to be uh, equal to, uh, by Q, uh, choosing Q such that, it, that this KL term becomes equal to zero. Uh, slightly wonky animation there, sorry. So we choose E, uh, we choose a new Q such that this KL term becomes zero which is easily done because the KL divergence is zero only if its two arguments are equal. So we choose this new Q to be equal to P Z given X is conditional for our current best guess of the parameters of the components. So we keep the parameters of the components fixed and we choose a new Q and then uh, because we've kept theta fixed, the log likelihood, log likelihood is the same. That hasn't changed. The size of this bar hasn't changed. KL has become zero, so we know that LQ is now 
uh, the full size of this uh, bar because K, we set KL to zero. And then, sorry, my slides are slightly out of order here. And then the second step, hold on. Um, This is the slide that should come next. Then the second step, M, is uh, to keep Q fixed and to recompute the parameters of these components, which we do by choosing uh, theta, the parameters of the components, to maximize this L function. So Q is kept fixed, so this KL term, uh, no, sorry, the KL term, we change P because we change parameters, so the KL term increases. And L also increases or stays the same because we're optimizing for the size of L. So what we see here is that in both of these steps, in the E step, we keep the log likelihood the same. And in the M step, we increase it because the KL uh, gets a little bigger and L gets a little bigger. Which means that if at every step we increase the uh, log likelihood or keep it the same, our algorithm must converge. So this is the proof of the convergence. Now all we need to do is, uh, for the Gaussian mixture model, fi figure out what these steps mean specifically. So this is what it means for the E step, we fill in the uh, responsibilities according to the new P function. For the M step, we now have an optimization objective, which is to maximize this function. So I'll go through this uh, very quickly. It's, uh, um, yeah, we optimize this L function. We, opt we choose theta to optimize this L function for a fixed Q. Uh, so we rewrite, we work out this Q, which doesn't uh, depend on theta, so that becomes a, a, an irrelevant term in the maximization objective, and this is our new maximization objective. So we can look at it in a 1D example. So we imagine we have a one-dimensional Gaussian mixture model. Let's see how we work out the mean for one of these components. And the rest, you can uh, take my word for it that that also works. So this uh, at the top here is our uh, maximization objective in general terms. This is what it looks like for a specific one-dimensional Gaussian mixture model. <coughs> so we're now we're fitting theta becomes the parameters of our Gaussian mixture model we sum over all components and all data points for this given Q function, which we don't change. Uh, and just to show it for one, uh, for one of the parameters, we look at the maximum of just the mean of the first component. Uh, this Q function are just our responsibilities that we derived in the previous step. So we fill in the responsibilities. R, I, X is the responsibility that component I took for point X. Then we do this logarithm thing. We work the logarithm into the um, normal distribution. And as, we, as we've seen before the break, basically the only thing that remains is this uh, squared error thing, and we get some uh, constants minus one half that we leave out in front of the sum. But this is the only relevant thing that remains. Uh, and the ln times the weights works out into an irrelevant term, which is relevant because we're only optimizing at the moment, we're only optimizing for the, uh, the mean of component one. Uh, so we apply, so this is our, now our optimization objective. Uh, da, 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 da. 
which, oh yeah, uh, so we take the derivative of this, which you see here. We work in the derivative into the sum, apply the sum rule. The only term that remains, uh, only terms in this sum that remains are the terms for mean one. Those are the only ones that we're interested in. The rest the derivative becomes zero. Um, which we know how to work out by the chain rule. So we take this whole thing, we set it equal to zero. Uh, we call this term here n1. And we find there's an x missing here. But if we rearrange this, we find that we end up with this weighted mean over the, uh, over the points. And the same thing works out if you uh, do that for uh, a multivariate normal distribution. You get uh, these solutions for the mean, the covariance, and the weights. So what's the point? How can we use this? What can we use this for? Well, firstly, we can use this for clustering. If we have a good fit for our multivariate Gaussian, we can interpret that as a clustering over the points. These are the separate clusters as the points, as we did in this example. We clustered our students into ambitious, challenged, and uh, failing students. Uh, very useful for exploratory analysis. We can also do this for classification. So remember, in Bayesian classification, the Bayesian classifiers that we saw in the previous probability lecture, we fit to each class separately a probability distribution, like this. Here we have a bunch of points. We fit a normal distribution to each, but the fit isn't very good. We can also fit a multivariate Gaussian to each class, get a much better fit, and therefore get a much better classifier. So in summary, normal distributions are great. Maximum likelihood fitting is a common and very helpful uh, approach. Gaussian mixture models are very flexible, but we cannot easily find the maximum, uh, we cannot easily find the uh, maximum likelihood fit but the EM algorithm is a form of alternating optimization, which does allow us to fit Gaussian mixture models to data. Next lecture, we'll look at hidden variable models in the context of neural networks. And that concludes the lecture for today. Thank you for your attention.